Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, all back from coffee once again, and we're ready to start program number three this afternoon. So again, we like to just welcome our television audience, and I have to keep reminding you, we'll never cease to thank the Lord enough for all your prayers, your, your kind letters. My, I always have to look at Iris, how we enjoy your letters. You know, I'm blessed. I, I know I mentioned it on a program years ago. One of the things that made me really you know, not want to jump on this when they called and asked if I would come on television because I thought I would just get abused and I would get verbally taken to the woodshed, you know. <laughs> but uh, it hasn't happened. We've probably had two or three that uh, were less than kind, but those kind are not hard to put in the trash can. <laughs> so, <laughs> but all of your mail, how we just thank you for your letters of encouragement and... Uh, we do. We just praise the Lord that he's seen fit to uh, protect us from all the attacks of the evil one. Shall so like I poor Daniel? Okay, here we are. Daniel now, just because of his faith and his trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, God had blessed him with all of his wisdom and understanding, his integrity, but yet the world, the world, they can't stand it, can they? They just can't handle a man of integrity. And uh, I could make comments even in our own political system that uh, let someone make a stand on their faith and they will be attacked like you cannot believe. Well, the same thing happened to Daniel. Just as soon as that decree was signed, instead of uh, putting a tail between his legs and running, what does Daniel do? He just flaunts it all the more. And uh, here we got it now then as we pick it up in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. <clears throat> well, reading verse 9 again, that's where we just left off. Wherefore King Darius signed the writing that he had been kind of hoodwinked into signing. And uh, he signs the writing and the decree. Now verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, and don't think he didn't know every word that it said, he went to his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. The decree didn't change one iota of Daniel's uh, respect and love for his God. All right. Verse 11. Then these men assembled. Now, remember who we're talking about. We're talking about the 120 back there in verse 1 and the other two of the three presidents. Daniel was one and two others. So the two presidents and the 120 are the conspiracy against him. All right, so then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spoke before the king concerning the king's decree. And this is what they tell the king. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days except of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. In other words, they could never change something that had been signed and decreed. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, see how they're pointing the finger at him, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, that Jew regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that you have signed. He makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with Daniel, no, with himself. He got tricked because he has a lot of respect for Daniel. Now, Darius, too, like Nebuchadnezzar, is going to be making progress to the place where he finally has to admit that the God of Israel is the God of everything. But so far, he's still sort of halfway between. All right? So he was utterly disgusted with himself. And... Uh, 
set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Now, what he did, we don't know, but he was evidently trying everything that the law would allow to reverse his decree, but <clears throat> these adversaries give him no room. Verse 15, so then these men, the 122, these men assembled unto the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established or signed can't be changed. So then the king commanded. They brought Daniel, cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, I suppose on his way to the lion's den, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will what? What do we have? I think an inkling now of Darius's faith in the God of Daniel. Now just watch for it as these men come ever so slowly toward a final recognition of the God of glory. All right? And so he says, I'm sure your God will deliver thee. Verse 17, a stone was brought, laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet so that there was no possible way of somebody slipping in and rescuing him, and with the signet of his lords that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Now we'll just move on. Verse 18, so the king went to his palace, passed the night fasting. See, he's not just forgetting about Daniel. He's doing everything he can to make sure that the God of Daniel will rescue him. So he begins with his fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. I think he paced the floor most of the night. Verse 19, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice. I imagine the old fellow thought he was spitting into the wind, as we say, that Daniel was long down the throats of the lions. I don't think he really expected an answer. And on the other hand, I think his faith is increasing that he felt it was possible. But you know, with a lamentable voice, he cried to Daniel, and the king spake and said, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God. See, he's not talking about his pagan gods now. He says, Daniel, is your God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? In verse 21. Now listen. Don't ever take this as just stories. This is the Word of God to prove His power. And like I said at the beginning of the first half hour, we have to understand that all the way up through Israel's history, the supernatural was not that unusual. Even in the life of some of the prophets and David and Solomon, the supernatural was evident, see? And uh, not like we are today. Well, you know, I always like to refer to Sir Robert Anderson's book, The Silence of God. If you haven't got it, for goodness sakes, buy it. One of the best books you can have in your library, The Silence of God. And what's he showing? That during this age of grace, God is not doing things like this. We're not to expect it. We're not to look for it. But it'll pick up again as soon as the tribulation starts when he starts dealing with Israel. See? All right. So now then back to Daniel. The Daniel says, O king, live forever. <laughs> He's as well as he was 24 hours ago. My God hath sent his angel. Shut the lion's mouths. They have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me and also before thee, O king, I have done no hurt. I haven't done any scandalized cooking the books. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> Daniel says, I'm not guilty of that. He said, I haven't embezzled. I haven't done anything contrary to your will. And so there was no spiritual reason for God to punish him, see? And so he said, I've done no hurt. And so the king, verse 23, 
the king was exceedingly glad for him, commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no matter of hurt was found upon him because he, what's the word? Believed. See, his faith. It's always been the faith. Starting with Adam, when he was restored to fellowship. Adam's faith, see? Daniel's faith, because he believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, uh, and Jacob. All right? Now verse 24. <clears throat> the king commanded, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel. See, now the worm turns, doesn't it? And those 122 men <clears throat> who had accused Daniel and cast them into the lion's den. But as the Orientals did all through history, it wasn't just the husband. They would kill the whole family, even as late as the Romans. If one of their politicians was found guilty, <coughs> it wasn't he alone, but his wife and children as well. So this is all typical of the Oriental mindset. And so they cast these 122 men into the den of lions, their children, their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them, broke all their bones in pieces wherever they came <clears throat> at the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote, All people, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Why? For he, the God of Daniel, is the living God. He's not just some piece of rock or gold, or silver. He is the living God and is steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even to the end. All right, now I'm just thinking of uh, a time way back during Moses serving Israel. Exodus chapter 18. Let's turn back. Because I want you to see that even though God was primarily dealing with Israel from the call of Abraham, whenever I put it on the board, I always say, Jew only with what? Exceptions. See, and I want you to realize that. That God did make exceptions. There were times when Gentiles came to a faith and trust in Israel's God. And I suppose I can just about use the rest of this half hour on this situation at the life of Moses, and it was his father-in-law. Who remembers the name of his father-in-law? Jethro. Jethro. Hey, that's good. I got some Bible students out there. Jethro. He was a Midian prince, and you remember that when Moses was first driven out of Egypt because he had killed the Egyptian, he took up with the gals that were watering the sheep. You remember the story? And uh, he ended up marrying one of them. So his father-in-law was this Jethro, a Midianite, see, a Gentile. All right, now here's the account, and I, I can't help but come back and, and show that how Jethro expressed much of the same things as Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, and I think Cyrus. I think all these Gentile kings came to a knowledge of salvation by faith in the God of Abraham. All right, chapter 18 of Exodus, starting at verse 1, honey. <clears throat> now when Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. All right, so then Jethro, the father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, you remember, when he was leading the children of Israel, and her two sons, Gershom, and uh, Eliezer in verse 4. So they come back with Jethro, and they find Moses out there in the wilderness. And uh, verse 5, J 
Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses in the wilderness, where he encamped at the mount of God down there at Sinai. And Jethro said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law, am come to thee and thy wife, their two sons with her. And Moses went out to meet him. And he did obeisance and kissed him, and, you know, the oriental way. And they asked each other of their welfare. Well, that's typical, isn't it? And they came into the tent. And Moses, verse 8, told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord delivered them. And Jethro, what's the next word? Rejoiced. Now the average Arab wouldn't feel that way. <laughs> they didn't think anything good should happen to Israel. But Jethro did. He rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel who had been delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 10, Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh. Verse 11, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Small g. See how far he's come? For in the thing wherein they dwelt probably, uh, proudly, he was above them. In other words, the God of Abraham is the God above everything. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and they stood by from morning to evening. And then, of course, we see that Jethro comes up with a means of helping Moses deal with all the responsibility. But what I wanted you to see was that even way back here, the father-in-law of Moses comes to a faith in the God of Abraham. All right, now then, with that, let's come back to Daniel once again. And uh, so Darius is following in the footsteps of Jethro and uh, a few others throughout the Old Testament who were Gentiles, but they came to embrace the God of Israel. And now we have Darius. All right. Let's just drop down where we left off. And so now Darius writes a new decree. Speaking of the God of Daniel, Verse 27, he delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. This same God delivered Daniel from the power of the lion. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of the next big emperor, Cyrus of the Persians. All right, now then, I guess we got a few minutes left. We'll go on into chapter 7. And now once again, we have a prophetic view of the future empires. But now instead of metals of gold, silver, and so forth, Daniel is going to see these Gentile empires as voracious beasts. And uh, that, of course, is what the Gentile empires have been. They've been bestial in their overall behavior. So in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, now this, of course, backs up again. This always is a chronological unfolding. But uh, now we're at a period of time when Daniel is probably in his mid-80s. And so in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, visions upon his bed. And he wrote the dream and told the sum. I saw the four winds of heaven striving upon the great sea. Now, that's not the Mediterranean or the Atlantic. It's the great sea of humanity. Even in that period of time, the then known world, already teeming with millions of folks. And out of that great sea of humanity, in his vision now, verse 3, he saw four great beasts, wild animals, come up from the sea, each one different from another. All right, now here we begin then the unfolding of these same four empires spoken of as beasts of prey. The verse 4, the first was like a lion, had eagle's wings, and he beheld in his vision 
till the wings thereof were plucked, it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now that's Daniel's picture of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. And we already have seen how that Nebuchadnezzar was removed, and then his grandson had the empire taken from him. All right, now then, following the Babylonian empire of Nebuchadnezzar, Nabonidus, and Belshazzar, in comes another, a second. This one is like to a bear. It raised up itself on one side, had three rib ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth, and they said unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. All right, so now then we have the Mede Empire coming all the way from present-day Iran, across present-day Iraq, present-day Persia, down across the land of Israel or Palestine, and all the way down to Egypt. That all became part then of the Mede and Persian Empire, and that's why it spoke of devouring much flesh. Now this is all history in advance. Now verse 6, after this, here comes the next empire, like a leopard, and it had upon the back of it four wings like a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, of course, what that is depicting is, I think most of you know the story of Alexander the Great, how he went swiftly across the Middle East and conquered more territory than even the Medes and the Persians had conquered, but he did it in such speed. Now, for that day and time, you got to remember that they were on foot, they were on horseback, and so forth. But he would take chances. In other words, he would cross maybe a bay at low tide. And he could do it quick enough. Instead of going miles around, he could just cut across. That was Alexander the Great. He took tremendous chances. But by it, he moved so swiftly. All right, now then, the vision depicts four. Well, we also know from history that when Alexander the Great died at the age of 33, his empire was divided between his four major generals. And so the empire was divided. And the part that affected Israel is that which we concern ourselves the most, and that, of course, was Persia and Egypt, and with Israel in the middle. All right, so here comes the prophecy then of the third empire, the Greek. Now we come to the fourth, which follows the Greek, and that is the Roman. And now we find an empire that, just like the feet of iron and clay, was indescribable, and so also with Daniel's vision. He just can't describe this fourth and final Gentile empire. And after this, verse 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, strong, exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was different or diverse from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. Now we know that the vision of, uh, of the Medes and the Persian was a two-horned creature. Greece was a one-horned creature. But this fourth beast has ten horns. And of course, it jumps all the way over to the end time when the Antichrist also will come out of a ten-nation consortium. All right, so the Roman Empire follows all these three previous ones. And it was by far more powerful, more fearsome, more heartless than any of the rest of them put together. All right, now verse 8. We just got to keep moving. Daniel says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came upon them another. Now, this is leaping to the tribulation period. That's what Scripture does. He's leaping all the way from 500 B.C. to wherever time is in front of us as yet when the tribulation will begin with the appearance of this man of sin, the son of perdition, and all the various terms of Scripture. I think there are 12 of them if you search through it. 
But there came up upon them a little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns out of the, out of the ten, plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn, this Antichrist, this prince of Daniel chapter 9, the son of perdition in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the man of sin, all those various terms are dealing with this Antichrist that is yet future. He's still out in front of us. And here's his description. In this horn, in this coming prince, were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. All right, let's just skip ahead to chapter 11 and we pick up a further description of this one little horn who is the coming Antichrist in Daniel chapter 11 and drop down to verse 21. Now all these descriptions of the Antichrist, whether it's in the Old Testament or if it's in Christ's earthly ministry or if it's in the book of Revelation, they all depict this coming world ruler which we feel the whole global system is being prepared for. Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person. Now he's going to be charismatic. In other words, he's going to be the kind of a person that the masses will, will flow, flow to. They're going to emulate him. They're going to worship him. But yet he is wicked to the nth degree. All right, so they'll stand up to a vile person in whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom, and I think it's basically the European Union, he will obtain the kingdom by flattery. What does that tell you? He's a smooth talker if ever there was one. He's going to be an orator. He's going to be someone that's going to be glib with his answers. Nobody's going to be able to embarrass him. And he's going to just simply uh, bamboozle, if I can use that word. He's going to bamboozle the world, and they're literally going to fall at his feet and acclaim him as the world's Messiah and Israel's Messiah all wrapped up in one. And so never lose sight of the fact that this little horn of Daniel chapter 7 is the Antichrist of the coming tribulation period. And we'll pick it up in our next half hour. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.